Today on the show, we're talking about the third use of the law as the solid declaration of the formula of Concord. Article 6 outlines it for us. It's a wonderful tool. After we look at Galatians 5 and 6 and bring comfort to all of our souls as we wrestle with how the law and the gospel relate for the Christian. All that and more is coming up right now on Cross Defense. Welcome to this week's episode of Cross Defense, the show where we aim to equip the mind, excite the imagination, and comfort the soul, all with God's Word. I'm your host, Reverend Tyrell Bramwell, the pastor of St. Mark Lutheran Church out here in Ferndale, California, which is where you can go if you'd like to contact me with your questions, comments, theological thoughts as you consider the curious topics that fill our world and you seek to discern them through the Christian's scriptural lens. I don't mean you have to come out here to Ferndale. I mean, go to our website. That's stmarksferndale.com slash contact. S-T-M-A-R-K-S ferndale.com slash contact to drop me a line with any of your questions, comments, suggestions for shows in the future, theological thoughts, this sort of thing. We do our best to address them on the air. Donna sent in a message that says, Appreciate Cross Defense. The recent shows on Cross Defense have been such a blessing. There is really a need for this kind of teaching. I'm in total agreement with what is being presented. It is just an amazingly uplifting experience to listen to these presentations that I don't hear elsewhere. Donna. From St. Petersburg, Florida. Thank you, Donna. And she says, will not be missing future podcasts. Wow, you must be a glutton for punishment. (laughs) Thank you very much for the kind words and for your support. May God bless you as you listen. And may he bless you as you receive the means of grace at church, in your church. Dear Pastor Bramwell, another listener writes, Wow, your episode on pietism was awesome. Thank you for your faithful presentation of piety and pietism. You did an excellent job pulling together material from other theologians and making sense of it all. There is so much evil in the world, and it seems to be getting worse. In the name of love and freedom and tolerance, many people just want to do whatever makes them happy. Ain't that right? They don't want to call anything sin. In their eyes, calling someone a sinner is hateful. Tell me about it, brother. I put out a sign that said, hurt by LGBTQ healing here, and I was called Hateful, a bigot, a racist, a homophobe, xenophobe, fill in the blank. I get it. I get it. They will pull the verse from the Bible and say, God is love. First John chapter 4. I think I heard protesters shouting this at you on YouTube. Yes, you did, my friend. Yes, you did. They have distorted the meaning of love. Indeed. You might consider doing an episode on the meaning of love. That's a great idea. From Christ's perspective, Old and New Testament, how we should love God with our whole heart and love our neighbors as ourselves, or as I also like to say, love each other as Christ has loved us. Keep up the great work. Keep preaching the truth. Fight the good fight. Lead folks to Jesus. Best regards in Christ. Steve from the Lutheran Church of Our Savior, Cupertino, California. Thank you, Steve, for that wonderful word of encouragement. And yes, we will put that into the uh, queue, a show on the actual meaning of the word love. Uh, One of the elders here at the church in uh, Ferndale has mentioned the same thing, that we really got to communicate what love means. It's not just an affirmation for someone to do whatever makes them happy, which is exactly, as you said, Steve, what the world thinks love is. Anything that says don't do that, they deem no as hateful. And as we do a good job in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod of teaching, God's word has a yes and a no, and both of them are loving. Neither of them are hateful. We need to hear no. We need to hear yes. We have, if you go to the Garden of Eden, right, they were given the yes to all of God's creation and a no to one particular tree. And everything would have been fine had we listened to that one word, no. It's also, we can think about it in a parental way, where one of the earliest ways, I like to say this quite often, one of the the earliest words that children learn is the word no. Oftentimes, it's the first word they learn. Why? Because mom and dad love them so very much that they care enough to say, no, don't put that in your nose. (laughs) No, 
don't do that. No, don't chew on that. No, don't touch that. No, get away from the electrical socket. No, no, no. I love you too much to let you do this. So you actually absolutely nailed it. Thanks, Steve. Rick and Sally emailed in this. Uh, they actually used the prayer request form over at St. Mark. Uh, if you click the contact button, there, you'll, you'll see there is a place where you can go for prayer requests or just contact. But they went to prayer request and they said, this is a reverse prayer request. <laughs> okay. We love Cross Defense and download it to our phones so we make time for you. Well, thanks, guys. Our prayers are with you and your flock. We appreciate it. Thanks for all you do for them and for us. Pray for our country and for a true revival of the Spirit. Thanks be to God for you, Rick and Sally. Buckle of the Bible Belt, Springfield, Missouri. Thank you guys for that word, wonderful word of encouragement and that reverse prayer request. So sweet. Okay, and so now another one last comment from our listeners, from you guys out there in Cross Defense Land. And this is going to be the one that drives the whole show and it is still in relation to the last three, which have was started with the uh, theater, right? And looking at modern theater, the cinema in your pocket, the streaming services and those shows we like to watch so much. And then we ended up last week with piety because it seemed pietistic to say that there is sin involved in watching all of these different shows coming out of the ent entertainment industry. And we, we looked at what pietism and piety is and all this. Well, this is a follow-up email from the, the listener who emailed in the question about whether or not uh, I or Walther was being too pietistic in the 10 arguments from Scripture against the theater. Here we go. From our listener, Jacob. Thank you very much, Jacob. By the way, I just want to front load this. Thank you for the follow-up. I love it. I re-listened to your episode entitled Entertainment, Social Media, and a Problem with the Chosen. You highlighted these as some points to consider when pondering if the consumption is a sin. And now he's going to give us these uh, guidelines, these questions from Theodore Gravener's book, Borderland of Right and Wrong. Does it contribute to my life? Does it injure others so that I have pleasure? Does it sublimate my passions? Does it waste my time? Does it waste my money? Does it build up my home life? Does it aid in my self-control? Does it sublimate my sex ideals? Does it shape my understanding of Christians? Does it cruelly twist how heathens perceive Christians. Okay, certainly, he says, I think this applies to a lot of my consumption of books, games, movies, shows, and the like. You're not alone, brother. Yes, it applies to so much of what we do. If you recall, the example that Grabner gave was golf, that golf can fit into these categories. Anything, any of the entertainments and amusements and these sorts of things can fit into these categories. It's a good rubric to you know, filter them through this, this sort of question, this, these lists of questions. By preaching and pointing me to the good and right law of God, you've pointed me to Christ. Praise be to God. The beautiful words of Martin Luther lay next to me on my desk. And here's the quote from Luther that he's talking about. For promises are not given for the purpose of snoring, loafing, and sleeping, or for doing what is in conflict with the promise. No, they are given for working, being watchful, and bearing fruit. Thus, I am not baptized, do not partake of the Lord's Supper, and I am not absolved for the purpose of sleeping and snoring at home in idleness. But if you have the promise, if you have baptism and absolution, Remember that you have been called to be watchful and to be anxiously concerned about the things that pertain to your faith and calling. How can we who died to sin still live in it, says Paul, Romans 6, 2. We are not absolved from sins in order that we may live for them and serve them, but in order that we may fight against them and stoutly persevere in the promise in order that I may chastise and mortify my flesh and bear it with a calm mind when God imposes a cross, in order that we may be purged and bring forth richer fruit. Oh. And then Jacob says, Praise be to God for such a theologian as Luther. Amen, brother. Amen. Lord, have mercy on me, he continues, a poor, miserable sinner. Pastor, what am I to do? This law has become slippery for me. 
Where am I to end its condemnation? The law keeps saying do, and even, even after the gospel says done, the law still preaches to my ears, and I fear that some of it is lies. Mm, very insightful, Jacob. My conscience is further troubled by this. I am but a new Lutheran, still asking the mere basics. Thank you for your time, Pastor. Your show has been such a comfort to my soul, and I feel my ignorance may be the thing stopping that from happening on these recent episodes. God's peace be with, and may God give you wisdom. Jacob. Oh, brother, I think you're well beyond basics, and thank you for these wonderful, wonderful words, honest words of character and integrity. Christian, you are a man of God, and I, I, dear sir, am blessed by your words. Our God is faithful, and he builds us up through the brotherhood of believers who show us Christ's activity in the lives of our fellow Christians for this purpose. It builds me up. It builds me up to know that there are brothers out there like you who take God's word as seriously as you do. What you're asking about is uh, commonly called the third use of the law, how the law applies to the Christian after the gospel. As you said, you, you still are hearing the do word language as if it's part of, and this is where I'm going to add, part of the justification process, part of you being justified after the gospel after it's been done. So we are going to make our way to the formula of Concord, solid declaration, and hear much brighter theologians than myself tell us about this use of the law. But before we get there, we're going to go into scripture because your language, your words, and, and just your communication for this show reminds me of Elijah. See, such powerful expressions of faith always, always take me back to Elijah in the cave. You know what I'm talking about? It's, it's 1 Kings 19.9, and there he came to a cave, and he lodged in it. He's living in this cave, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And picking up at verse 14, we read, Elijah answers this repeated question. He gets this question several times. Uh, he said, I have been very jealous for Yahweh, for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So he's hiding, remember? And the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Ebel, Meholoah, or however you say that, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Haziel shall Jehu put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elijah put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000. I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. And now, what does Paul say about this event when he quotes it in 11, Romans 11, excuse me, Romans 11? Jacob, may this comfort your soul, may it comfort all of our souls as we ponder it today. Paul writes, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, Paul says, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? 
I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant, Paul says, chosen by, key word here, Jacob, grace. Chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Grace, brother. Grace. Turn with me now to Galatians 5. We're going to have to interrupt this reading for a break, but turn with me to Galatians 5, and let's get started hearing some more about how you, none of us, are saved by our works. We don't talk about the 10 arguments against attending the theater because by keeping those arguments, by not attending the theater, we're saved. You'll notice if you re-listen to those three episodes, I don't issue any sort of edicts or commands about how to exercise what Walther says about attending the theater. That's for you and your pastor and scripture, your family to figure out. That's not my place on this show. But we are talking about sin. We do identify it. We equip the mind to know so that the Overton window doesn't slide us into a place where we think it's now okay because like the frog in the pot, the water has been turned up and before we know it, we're cooked. No, we don't want to do that. So we want to talk about sin, not to enslave ourselves, but to be aware, to be aware that there is still this thing called sin. And if we're not careful and diligent, watchful, we can end up sliding down that slippery slope, sliding to a place where in our day and age, we no longer consider this. And this is exactly what's going on with all the LGBTQ stuff. It's exactly what's going on with the racism stuff. It's exactly what's going on in so many different denominations with uh, the abortion issue. This is how you can have pastors who are supporters of abortion in certain denominations. Why? Because they've learned to justify the sin. They're no longer calling it sin. They're no longer calling it what it is. And we too are at danger of doing that always because we're sinners. What is, what is the hat trick of the enemy? What is, what is the threefold enemy we contend against? The devil, the world, and our own sinful nature. So we have to realize we are predisposed to want to justify our sin, our pet sin, the thing we want to do. But when we recognize we are sinning. We are not to throw the baby out with the bathwater and think that we need to keep the law. We need to repent of that sin and keep it in order to be saved. We don't turn to our works to find comfort and peace. When we realize we've been doing something that is a sin, we are to repent and turn to Christ again in baptism, to rely on our baptism, to rely on Christ and him alone. Okay, so we're going to get to Galatians 5. I think I've talked long enough to where we won't have to interrupt it. Let's take a break. And when we get back, Galatians 5. So open your Bibles there. I'll be right back. You're listening to Cross Defense. Martin Luther wrote these powerful words in his small catechism. As the head of the family should teach them in a simple way to his household. He reminded the church then and today to learn by heart the basics of the Word of God and the Gospel. I'm Pastor Brady Finner, host of Concord Matters. Join me as we get back to the basics with the six chief parts. Grab your catechism and be ready for a simple, theologically rich study with lots of Jesus. Saturday mornings at 10 on KFUO and on demand at KFUO.org, the KFUO radio app, and anywhere you get podcasts. Are your Bibles open to Galatians 5? Great! I'm glad to hear it. For freedom Christ has set us free, Paul tells us. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, that was the topic at hand in Galatians, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. We're not talking about, in any of those previous episodes or ever, being justified by keeping the law. And we'll get to the formula of Concord and flesh that out in just a minute. We're talking about knowing what 
the law is, that it's good for the Christian to be able to identify sin, to be able to keep the God, God's will, because we want to. Not that we can perfectly, not that it is a burden, but so that we can strive toward that which thing, that thing which we know is good by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, as he says, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. So if you're, you're falling back under the law to justify your works, to get you into heaven, then you are in for trouble. You got to keep it all. You are severed from Christ, from the gospel. You who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. So hear this. For in Christ Jesus, neither attending the theater or not attending the theater counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well, he says. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves, live the whole law through. It's circumcision, right? I just preached this, I mentioned this in my sermon last Sunday, that you know, in this context, we're, Paul's not mentioned any words, is he? And he says in, this, in the context of circumcision, don't just snip the tip, but take the whole thing off, which is really powerful. If you're going to keep the law, keep the whole law. You have to if you're keeping the law for justification. That's not why we look to the Ten Commandments as if we're justified by the keeping of them. We look to the Ten Commandments to realize how much of a Savior we need. We need Christ more than ever. We go from thinking we're you know, sinning once or twice a day to realizing that we sin nonstop. Brother, don't let the conversation about identifying sin trap you and bind you in a box. That's not the point of it. That's not the point at all. Verse 13, you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. We strive to fulfill the commandments in service to our neighbor, not in service to us. You're not on some slippery slope there, sliding back into the law. No, you are still as forgiven as you ever were. You are, your, your entire email, your questions, your Christian character and integrity are about how do I live in a way to serve my neighbor? So don't lose sight of that, my friend. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. Oh, skipped ahead. For the whole law, verse 14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Keep walking by the Spirit in the cross. Keep your eyes on Christ, and, and you will not start veering off into the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace 
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, Jacob, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, verse 25, let us all also keep step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And now we continue into Galatians 6. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. That's the whole point of all of the conversations we've had leading up to this. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. I think we're experiencing that in our culture today with the entertainment industry, with this whole conversation. We are reaping what we've sown with a wholesale acceptance of modern theater, with a wholesale acceptance of all the sin and all of our justifying of it and, and acting like it's not a big deal, that it's not as sinful as it is. That's the point. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. See, with what large letters I am writing to you, with my own hand, Paul says, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law. But they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the word has been crucified to me, and I to the world. The world, excuse me, has been crucified to me, and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. <laughs> Do you hear what Paul's saying? We are justified by Christ. It is finished. Everything you need for your salvation has been accomplished. It is done. Identifying sin that we didn't once think was sin is not re-enslaving you when we understand why we're identifying it. Not that you have to keep the law perfectly to merit heaven to earn the kingdom of God. No, that's, in, that's ridiculous. You can't do that. We bring it up so that you don't slip into it, fall into it unawares. We bring it up so that you're able to not fall. So you know what these things are. At least the, look, what does he say? Let me scroll back up here. The, the acts of uh, the, the, the flesh. So we know what the acts of the flesh are. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. 
519, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We want to know what these things are so as to mark them and avoid them. Does that mean you will always avoid them? No, you're going to fall into them. You're going to sin. We, this list of things, we all do these things. We all sin these ways. If not physically, outwardly, internally by our heart, we are guilty of these things, which is why we need Christ, which is why circumcision or uncircumcision doesn't save us, which is why going to the theater or not going to the theater, watching that show or not watching that show is not a matter of your salvation. Christ is your salvation, brother. Christ. So don't let the enemy twist what you've heard, the wonderful conversation, identifying these things that are, that are acts of the flesh. Don't let him twist that into a rule that will trouble your conscience and make you a slave under the law again. That is not the intention, my friend. And likewise, that means we don't have to uh, compromise these things and pretend like they're gospel when they're not. We are, Romans tells us, right? Paul writes, we're not free to sin that grace may abound, so just keep on sinning. By no means, he says. We identify these things to rely on Christ all the more. All the more. Okay, so what does Scripture say about what justifies you? Put it in your own words. And I think you're you're farther along in your... your uh, your newness is a Lutheran, as they say, than you might think. These aren't mere basics. This is the whole substance of this stuff. Law and gospel. You are justified by the gospel. That's what saves you, the grace of Christ. Not the law. Not the law. That's why Christ's crucifixion is called good news. Evangelion. It's the gospel. It's the good news that you are justified purely by grace the grace of Christ alone, by no works of your own, by the one who kept the law perfectly in your place as your substitute. None of your, your actions can save you. Your best deeds are as filthy rags. They're tainted with sin. They're tainted with sin. So now let's turn to wiser and more articulate theologians than Yours truly. We're going to go to Article 6 of the Solid Declaration of the Formula of Concord for the remainder of today's show. And this is concerning what they call the third use of the law. And here's what the Formula of Concord says. We unanimously believe, teach, and confess that although the truly believing and truly converted to God and justified Christians are liberated and made free from the curse of the law, yet... They should daily exercise themselves in the law of the Lord, as it is written in Psalm 1, 2, and 119, 1. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. For the law is a mirror in which the will of God and what pleases him are exactly portrayed and which should therefore be constantly held up to the believers and be diligently urged upon them without ceasing. For although the law is not made for a righteous man, as the apostle testifies in 1 Timothy 1.9, but for the unrighteous, yet this is not to be understood in the bare meaning that the justified are to live without the law. That's not the, God, the idea. For the law of God has been written in their heart. And also to the first man immediately after his creation, a law was given according to which he was to conduct himself. But the meaning of St. Paul is that the law cannot burden with its curse those who have been reconciled to God through Christ. Do you see that? Do you hear that? Adam was even given a law in, in the garden not to eat of that tree, right? Right after his creation, he was given this law, but it wasn't meant to be a burden. The meaning of St. Paul is that the law cannot burden with its curse. 
those who have been reconciled to God through Christ. Nor must it vex the regenerate with its coercion. It doesn't need to vex our consciences because they have pleasure in God's law after the inner man. And indeed, if the believing and elect children of God were completely renewed in this life by the indwelling spirit, so that in their nature and all of its powers they were entirely free from sin, they would need no law, and hence no one to drive them either. But they would do of themselves and altogether voluntarily without any instruction, admonition, urging, or driving of the law. But they are in duty bound to do according to God's will. Just as the sun, the moon, and all the constellations of heaven have their regular course of themselves, unobstructed, without admonition, urging, driving, or compulsion, force, according to the order of God, which God once appointed to them. Yea, just as the holy angels render an entirely voluntary obedience. You hear what's being said here? It's not as if when you are a Christian, we cease preaching the law to us. Our old Adam clings to us. And so we use the law to chastise the old man for discipline's sake, for correction's sake, to to show us the will of our Father and to slay in the fountain of baptism the temptations of the flesh that still linger and want to win the day. Okay, let's take a break right there. We'll be back for the remainder of our reading from the Formula of Concord, Solid Declaration, Article 6, concerning the third use of the law. Thanks for listening with me today. we got one more segment of Cross Defense. Coming up. Hello, friends. I'm Pastor Phil Boo, host of Thy Strong Word. Each weekday morning at 11 a.m., join me and a guest pastor as we explore God's Word, which strengthens our faith and guides our lives. You can listen over the air, online at kfuo.org, or through your favorite podcasting app. Just search for Thy Strong Word, only from KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Thanks for tuning in to Cross Defense. We continue with the Formula of Concord, Solid Declaration, Article 6, concerning the third use of the law. And if you're curious, I'm going to be reading, I am reading from bookofconcord.org. It's a free uh, version of the Book of Concord, so not everybody has one in their personal library. If you need to go online, you can definitely go to bookofconcord.org. Also, remember, if you want to get a hold of me, you can go to stmarksferndale.com slash contact. That's S-T-M-A-R-K-S, ferndale.com slash contact. Continuing with our reading, however, believers are not renewed in this life perfectly or completely, as the ancients say. For although their sin is covered by the perfect obedience of Christ, so that It's not imputed to believers for condemnation. And also the mortification of the old Adam and the renewal in the spirit of their mind is begun through the Holy Ghost. Nevertheless, the old Adam clings to them still in their nature and all its internal and external powers. Of this, the apostle has written Romans 7, 18 and following, I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Not a single good thing. And again, for that which I do not allow, not for what I would that I do not, but that what I hate, I do. Likewise, I see another law in my members. That's a complicated uh, (laughs) rendering of Romans 7. The ESV is a little easier to read. But what I hate that I do, likewise, I see another law in my members. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. Likewise, Galatians 5.17, as we've already read on today's show, the flesh 
lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you want to do, that you would do. Therefore, because of these lusts of the flesh, the truly believing, elect, and regenerate children of God need in this life not only the daily instruction and admonition, warning, and threatening of the law, but also frequently punishments, that they may be roused. The old man is driven out of them and follow the Spirit of God. As it is written in Psalm 119, 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. And again, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. And again, in Hebrews 12, 8, But if you would be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons, it says. As Dr. Luther has fully explained this at greater length in the summary, uh, the summer part of the church postal, on the epistle of the 19th Sunday after Trinity. Okay, so see, what's being said is that the law is good, even for the Christian. It's good for discipline's sake. Not talking about your, your justification. Not talking about taking away your birthday. You're still a Christian. And yet, this is what you're bringing up, my friend Jacob. This is what we all are bringing up. We're all wrestling with. You're, you're so far not alone. You're, you're so entirely not alone, the discipline, the growing in our faith, the working against the, the lusts of the flesh, letting the law have its way with us to where we understand things that we want to do are not always good for us. Whether that's talking about streaming a show on Netflix or wasting your time playing too much golf. <laughs> we want to understand what is good and wholesome for us. But don't lose sight of the gospel because none of that is to say that you will lose your salvation. Christ died for you. That's what earned you salvation. Continuing with the, the wiser theologians than myself from the Formula of Concord, but we must also explain distinctively what the gospel does, produces, and works towards the new obedience of believers and what is the office of the law in this matter as regards the good works of believers. For the law says, indeed, that it is God's will and command that we should walk in a new life. But it does not give the power, it doesn't give the ability to begin and to do it. But the Holy Ghost who is given and received not through the law, but through the preaching of the gospel. Galatians 3.14 renews the heart. Thereafter, the Holy Ghost employs the law so as to teach the regenerate from it and to point out and to show them in the Ten Commandments what is the good and acceptable will of God, Romans 12.2, and what good works God has before ordained that we should walk. Ephesians 2.10. He exhorts them thereto, and when they are idle, negligent, and rebellious in this matter because of the flesh, he reproves them on that account through the law so that he carries on both offices together. He slays and he makes alive. He leads into hell and he brings up again. For his office is not only to comfort, but also to reprove. As it is written, when the Holy Ghost has come, he will reprove the world, which includes also the old Adam of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. But sin is everything that is contrary to God's law. And St. Paul says all scripture given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, etc. This is what I was pointing out with practical theology from Reverend Preuss, right? 
and reprove is the peculiar office of the law. Therefore, as often as believers stumble, they are reproved by the Holy Spirit from the law, and by the same Spirit are raised up and comfort again with the preaching of the Holy Gospel. But in order that as far as possible, all misunderstanding may be prevented, and that distinction between the works of the law and those of the Spirit be properly taught and preserved, it is to be noted with a special diligence that when we speak of good works which are in accordance with God's law, for otherwise they are not good works, then the word law has only one sense, namely the immutable will of God, according to which men are to conduct themselves in their lives. The difference, however, is in the works because of the difference in the men who strive to live according to this law and will of God. For as long as man is not regenerate and therefore conducts himself according to the law and does the works because they are commanded thus, from fear of punishment or desire for reward, he is still under the law. And his works are called by St. Paul properly works of the law, for they are exhorted by the law extorted, excuse me, by the law, big difference there, as those of slaves, and these are saints after the order of Cain, that is, these are hypocrites. Let's pause and re-digest that. Here it is again. For as long as man is not regenerate and therefore conducts himself according to the law and does the works because they are commanded thus from fear of punishment or desire for reward, he is still under the law. Are you, are you making your decisions based on fear of punishment? Or are you making your decisions based on a desire to earn yourself a way to heaven? Then you're still under law. And his works are called by St. Paul properly works of the law. For they are extorted by the law as those of slaves. And these are saints after the order of Cain. That is, these are hypocrites. And we don't want to do that. You don't want to put yourself back under the law as if keeping the law, not attending the theater or not streaming that show is somehow meriting you good works. These become, properly speaking, works of the law because you're doing them to either avoid punishment or to earn the reward of heaven. That's not why we do them. That's not why we keep the law. Not in accordance with the gospel, right? Continuing with the formula. But when man is born anew by the Spirit of God and liberated from the law, that is, freed from his driver and is led by the Spirit of Christ, he lives according to the immutable will of God comprised in the law. And so far as he is born anew, does everything from a free, cheerful spirit. And these are called not properly works of the law, but works and fruits of the Spirit, or as St. Paul names it, the law of the mind and the law of Christ. For such men are no more under the law, but under grace. As St. Paul says in Romans 8, 2. Also Romans 7, 23. 1 Corinthians 9, 21. But since believers are not completely renewed in this world, we continue. But the old Adam clings to them even to the grave. There also remains in them the struggle between the spirit and the flesh. Therefore, they delight indeed in God's law according to the inner man. But the law in their members struggles against that law in their mind. Hence they are never without the law. And nevertheless are not under, but in the law. And live and walk in the law of the Lord and yet do nothing from constraint of the law. But as far as the old Adam is concerned, which still clings to them, he must be driven not only with the law, but also with punishments. Nevertheless, he does everything against his will and under coercion. No less than the godless are driven and held in obedience by the threats of the law. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Romans 7, 8, and 19. So too, so too, this doctrine of the law is needful for believers. In order that they may not hit upon a holiness and devotion of their own, and under the pretext of the Spirit of God, set up a self-chosen worship, 
without God's word and command. As, as it is written in Deuteronomy 12, 8, 28, 32. You shall not do. Every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. Etc. But observe and hear all these words which I command you. You shall not add to, thereto or diminish therefrom. We must remember... God is the one who sets up the system, right? This is the, the danger we have in today's world, is this idea that under the, the pretext of the Spirit of God, so under the pretext of the gospel, we can break God's law with this false sense of security. And that's, that's how presenting something about, you know, such an institutional sin, sinfulness, you know, bringing the concept to our, to our minds, the forefront of our minds about just how sinful the theater might be, the entertainment industry might be, even though we all recognize it personally, to have a pastor speak about it, it makes us go, ooh, hold on, because we see how systemic it is. And we know that the gospel doesn't give us the freedom to live in this debauchery where we're still people who our old Adam needs the discipline of the law, not to earn salvation, but to keep us from sliding back into it. So too, we read, the doctrine of the law in and with the exercise of the good works of believers is necessary for the reason that otherwise man can easily imagine that his work and life are entirely pure and perfect. <laughs> But the law of God, that's exactly what's going on. But the law of God prescribes to believers good works in this way, that it shows and indicates at the same time as in a mirror that in this life they are still imperfect and impure in us. So that we must say with the beloved Paul, 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified? Thus Paul, when exhorting the regenerate to good works, presents to them expressly the Ten Commandments, Romans 13, 9, and that his good works are imperfect and impure. He recognizes from the law, Romans 7, 7 and following. And David declares, Psalm 119, 32, I will run the way of thy commandments, but enter not into judgment with thy servant. For in thy sight shall no man li living be justified, Psalm 143, 2. See how the law and the gospel are working for the new man and the old man. But how and why, back to the formula, the good works of believers, although in this life they are imperfect and impure because of sin in the flesh, are nevertheless acceptable and well-pleasing to God, is not taught by the law, which requires an altogether perfect, pure obedience, if it is to please God. But the gospel... The gospel teaches that our spiritual offerings are acceptable to God through faith in Christ's sake. 1 Peter 2, 5. For Christ's sake, excuse me. And Hebrews 11, 4 and following. In this way, Christians are not under the law. But we are under grace, Jacob. Because by faith in Christ, the persons are freed from the curse and condemnation of the law. And because their good works, although they are still imperfect and still impure, are acceptable to God through Christ. Moreover, because so far as they have been born anew, according to the inner man, they do what is pleasing to God, not by coercion of the law, but by the renewing of the Holy Spirit, voluntarily and spontaneously from their hearts. However, they maintain, nevertheless, a constant struggle against the old Adam. For the old Adam as an intractable, refractory ass <laughs> is still a part of them, which must be coerced to the obedience of Christ, not only by the teaching, admonition, force, and threatening of the law, but also oftentimes by the club of punishments and troubles until the body of sin is entirely put off and man is perfectly renewed in the resurrection when he will need neither the preaching of the law nor its threatenings and punishments as also the gospel any longer. For these belong to this mortal and imperfect life. But as they will behold God face to face, so they will, through the power of the indwelling Spirit of God, do the will of God, the Heavenly Father, with unmingled joy, 
voluntarily, unconstrained, without any hindrance, with entire purity and perfection. I can't wait. And will rejoice in it eternally. Accordingly, we reject and condemn as an error pernicious and detrimental to Christian discipline, as also to true godliness, the teaching that the law in the above-mentioned way and degree should not be urged upon Christians and the true believers, but only upon the unbelieving unchristians and impenitent. We can't say the law is only for the unchristian, the non-Christian. All right, my friends, we're out of time. Good timing, right? <laughs> We're out of time, Jacob. I hope that helps. And it's not just you, brother. It's for all of us. We all wrestle with this. We all struggle. And that is exactly why we turn to the scriptures, firstly, and to wise, wise theologians throughout the ages, secondly. And of course, to your pastor. Turn to your pastor, brother. God gave you a man right where you're at to help you with all these things. It's just my pleasure to be a little seasoning through KFUO.org where Christ is for you anytime, anywhere. But turn to the real meal. Our Lord has given you a pastor. Go to him. All right, guys. That's it for today's show. Christ be with you until next time. Peace, my friends. Peace in the gospel. I love you. And I'll talk to you next week. Cross Defense is a production of KFUO Radio. Find past episodes and support Cross Defense at KFUO.org.